Hello, and welcome to the CSS News Civil War Interpretive Center. My name is Matthew Young, I'm the site manager, and I wanted to give you an overview today of the CSS News, its history, uh, and how it came to be here at the Interpretive Center. So what you see here uh, on the screen is a, an image of the news as it appears today in the museum. Uh, you see the lighting on the wooden hull, and then there is a metal frame that goes over the top of it, kind of gives you an outline structure or a ghosting structure to show you how the ship would have appeared uh, if it had been completed and was in the museum today. So why an ironclad? Why was ironclad development so important in the 1860s? Well, first of all, the Union Navy established a blockade around the South when the war began as part of uh, Winfield Scott's Anaconda Plan. Uh, so establishment of that blockade meant the South would have to defend itself with limited resources. Remember the South at this time is largely agrarian, uh, not very much industry, and also um, not very many deep water ports for shipbuilding. The majority of the shipbuilding in the United States was concentrated in the Mid-Atlantic and New England. There were really only a few ports in the South that could build larger warships. Uh, Norfolk in Virginia was one and New Orleans was the other. And both Norfolk and New Orleans would fall uh, by the middle end of 1862, thereby limiting uh, where the South was able to build ships for defense. As you can see, North Carolina has a lot of waterways rivers that go from deep interior into the state all the way out into the sounds Albemarle and Pamlico and then out into uh, the ocean defending these this coastline and the internal waterways were vital to the security of the state of North Carolina and so North Carolina started petitioning the Confederate government for resources to defend those waterways. And remember, those waterways acted as highways from the coast uh, to the internal part of the state. The Confederate Secretary of the Navy, uh, Stephen Mallory, had served as a U.S. Senator on the Naval Affairs Committee uh, before secession, before the outbreak of the war. He also knew of uh, some of the battles that had happened during the Crimean War in the 1850s and the creation of a French floating battery in the Crimean War. It was called an Etna class. It was iron, it was armored, uh, it did move very quickly, but they did put steam engines in it. Therefore, he had this idea that steam-powered floating armored batteries could be used for coastal and river defense in the south. Building these did not require the deep water ports for construction like Norfolk and New Orleans. So therefore they were able to be built in other places such as Wilmington or Charleston or Savannah, uh, cities that had access uh, to riverways and the sea. By October of 1862, it was clear uh, after the fall of New Bern, after the fall of um, Roanoke Island after the fall of Moorhead City and Fort Macon that uh, more defense was needed in eastern North Carolina. So in October of 1862, the Confederate Navy contracted to build three river defense ironclads in North Carolina. The CSS Albemarle on the Roanoke River, uh, an ironclad on the Tar River, and the CSS Noose on the Noose River. And the ship firm of Howard and Ellis received the contract. Now, Howard and Ellis, interestingly enough, was out of New Bern. But of course, New Bern was occupied by federal troops, so they didn't have access to their home office. They had to kind of do everything on the fly and do it out in the field. And construction on the Noose began at Whitehall on the uh, Noose River, and Whitehall today is currently called Seven Springs. Um, and it began construction, as I said, in October of 1862. Work was slow going, and it was interrupted two months later by the raid of General John G. Foster. 
Uh, Foster came over with about 12,000 men out of New Bern. He first attacked Kinston, and then he moved down the News River towards Goldsboro, which was his ultimate objective. The objective was to destroy the railroad bridge between uh, that went over the News River uh, in Goldsboro and was a link between Wilmington in the south and Weldon, North Carolina in the north, which supplied uh, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Coincidentally, this attack happened at the same time as Burnside's expedition uh, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, uh, December of 1862. Foster's raid delayed construction of the news, but it didn't stop it, it didn't cease it. Uh, the, the ship, uh, or what was becoming the ship, was not destroyed. As a matter of fact, it began construction about a month later, delayed it four to six weeks, and by late spring, there was a uh, empty shell of a hull that was put into the river and brought down to Kinston. And when it, were, uh, when it arrived at Kinston, they placed it uh, near where the King Street Bridge is today. Uh, there was kind of a high bluff area there. They built a coffer dam around it, and they began to uh, move material and supplies in to outfit the ship for war. So she's officially designated as an ironclad ram. Now, what that means is that if it did not shoot you uh, with her guns, she had an iron back wooden ram on the front designed to penetrate into the side of your ship, ram into you, and sink you. This is exactly what the uh, Confederate ironclad Virginia, also known as the Merrimack, did uh, in March of 1862 in Hampton Roads. It rammed and sank uh, a Union warship. The ship was 152 feet long, it was 34 feet wide, and depending on how much coal and machinery she, she had on board, uh, had a between an eight to nine foot draft. She was armed with two 6.4 inch Brook rifle cannon. Uh, however, she had uh, gun ports. Each one could fire out of one of five gun ports. So there were 10 gun ports on the noose. However, she only had two guns. So if you're firing a broadside out of one side, both guns could be aimed to fire out the broadside or uh, one out the front, one out the back. There's a lot of different variations. She was also powered by uh, two steam screw engines. She had two uh, engines inside that were vastly underpowered. Uh, they likely came from uh, saw, local saw mills, lumber mills. She also had a small donkey engine. And we think the donkey engine was probably used to power the ship's pumps. One of the issues that the news ran into immediately, as did most Southern ironclads, is that she was built out of green wood. Uh, therefore, she leaked. Uh, there was warping and cracking in the wood. The wood did not have time to season. It would have taken several years to season enough wood uh, to build these ships. So basically, they were cutting down trees, sawing them, and then putting them together without, uh, without letting the wood season. So it led to issues down the road. Same thing happened with construction of ironclads in Wilmington. By April of 1864, she is ready to go into the river. She is officially commissioned the CSS Noose. Uh, she is launched in late April of 1864 out of Kinston. Uh, she and her sister ship, the CSS Albemarle, were supposed to go down to the port of New Bern in conjunction with an army attack and retake the town of New Bern for the Confederacy. However, uh, not even a half a mile downriver, because of falling river levels and the deep draft of the noose, she ran aground. She got stuck on a sandbar. And according to diary entries and letters written at the time by members of the crew, uh, they tried everything they could to get her off, but it didn't work. Uh, the water was falling too quickly, and the ship was rapidly coming out of the water. Fortunately, she had a uh, she ran aground on a soft bed of sand. So, despite the fact she had no water under her to support her for some of this time, uh, there was no serious damage on board the ship. Uh, she remained grounded for almost a month until late May of 1864 when rains uh, in the center part of the state uh, flowed into the noose and raised the ship. By that time, 
the expedition on Newbern had been called off. Uh, the Arbor Marl wasn't able to make it either. And the noose returned to her moorings uh, in Kinston and was docked there. So between April of 1864 and almost a year later, in March of 1865, the news pretty much remained dockside in Kinston. Uh, they probably did some small refits and reworkings on her, added some things, um, probably gilded up the interior a little more, added hooks and doorknobs and keys and, and locks, things they may not have had time to do uh, when they were uh, trying to get the ship ready to be commissioned in April of 1864. And during this time, she also changed commanders. Her final commander came on board. Uh, his name was Joseph Price, and Price was a native North Carolinian. As a matter of fact, he was from Wilmington, North Carolina, and he took command of the ship. By March of 1865, the situation around Kinston has drastically changed. Um, Fort Fisher in the south had fallen. The port of Wilmington had been taken. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's armies were coming up from South Carolina. Um, Schofield and Cox had built up tremendous forces in New Bern and were starting to advance to the west. The idea was for them to meet up with Sherman's army in the town of Goldsboro, again, a vital rail junction in the state. At that time, Captain Price received orders from General Braxton Bragg to engage the enemy vigorously, then return to Kinston and destroy the noose to prevent it from falling into enemy hands. This is exactly what he did. According to the gunner on board the noose, the ship engaged the enemy and the booming was her funeral knoll. She returned to Kinston, not far from where she had beached or ran aground um, the year before. They set the ship on fire, they broke up the ship's wheel and they planted explosives in the port bow, which all sank the ship. She was scuttled. There were items that were probably removed off the ship, but fortunately for us, more than 10,000 items were not removed off the ship. And when it was recovered, it, it was the largest, and I believe still to this day, is the largest intact uh, item, number of items recovered off of any Confederate vessel. Uh, over 10,000 objects have been identified or removed from the noose. Now, many of them are spikes and nails and plates and things of that nature, trunnels, uh, which get very repetitive after a while. But there are quite a few unique objects and items that were also recovered off the ship. So she sank in March of 1865. The crew abandoned her. Uh, many of them went to Halifax, North Carolina to await further instruction. And that's when Lee surrenders his army, Johnston surrenders his army, and the war virtually comes to a close. At that time, the United States government said, all former Confederate property now belongs to us. They also assumed all Confederate debt. It's an interesting thing to do. And one of the things they did was they put out salvage contracts on Confederate ships that had either been sunk or scuttled, including the CSS News. This is an image of the news of sister ship, the CSS Albemarle, uh, as it sat in um, post-war Virginia. Most of her armor and her guns have been removed. Uh, the news would have appeared somewhat similar to this, except she had her armor and her guns as she was sunk right here uh, in Kinston. The salvage firm of Satterley and Lyon out of New York was contracted to come and recover uh, parts of the CSS news. They were able to get most of the iron plating. They retrieved the um, engines, the boilers, the machinery, the propellers, the anchor, the anchor chains. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of um, salvage was done. The they got the guns, but the guns were retained by the U.S. Navy. Everything else went to Satterley and Lyon. And according to records, they sold most of everything locally. Um, the engines went to a different sawmill. Uh, boilers went to different companies, and they sold most of the iron and maritime surplus in New Bern uh, at a profit. The ship largely sat ignored from 1865 until the early 1960s. 
when the uh, Confederate Centennial Commission of Lenore County got together and said, hey, what did Kinston and Lenore County do during the Civil War? What was something that was done here? And the answer clearly was they built a gunboat. They built an ironclad here, most of it. And they knew where it was, but they didn't know how big it was. They didn't know what was left of it. And so a recovery process began in 1962. You see there on the left is part of the hull of the ship. On the right is the United States Marine Corps coming and retrieving original Brook rifle shells that were still active and still live and still could explode. They had to go through EOD process in order to um, make sure all those shells were safe. We now have all those in our collection. Um, unfortunately, about half of the ship was destroyed as they recovered it. Uh, one, the main reason for this was it was just too big and too heavy uh, to pull out of the river, waterlogged as big as it was. So they ripped up the forward decking, they destroyed interior panels, walkways, doorways, passageways, <clears throat> and then when they were finally able to get it up on shore, they chainsawed what was left of the ship into three pieces in order to move it, which they did. Uh, they moved it to the Governor Richard Caswell Memorial, which was the closest state-owned land uh, to the recovery site. It then became a historic site. School children, adults, uh, many people who wanted to know more information about what the noose was, how it contributed to the war effort, and what its role was in eastern North Carolina, uh, came by the thousands uh, between the, the late 1960s and um, the early 2000s. The problem that the news had in its new home is that it was very close to the News River. Um, so close, in fact, that two very large hurricanes uh, had an impact on her. You can see that the site was almost flooded, virtually flooded, uh, in 1996, I believe that was Hurricane Fram that did that. And at that time, uh, part of the visitor center was damaged. And they said, look, I know this is a once in a century storm, but we need to move this ship away from being so close to the river and put it out closer to the road. So in the following couple of years, they built a temporary shelter by Vernon Avenue uh, which was the main thoroughfare, and they moved the ship. I believe they moved it in 1998. And in 1999, Hurricane Floyd hit. And Floyd destroyed the visitor center and probably would have carried the remains of the noose down the river um, if she hadn't been moved. We probably would have lost the ship. Fortunately, it was moved the year before. At this time, many people came forward and were concerned about the future of the ship what would be left uh, of it for future generations. Um, they had several experts come out and look and say, look, if you don't move this ship, you're going to lose it in the next 50 to 100 years, because even though you have it under a shelter, it's still exposed to the heat and the cold uh, that you get in the varying temperatures between the seasons here in Eastern North Carolina. So they came up with a new plan. They decided to purchase a building in downtown Kinston uh, the local folks helped tremendously in Kinston, trying to raise money to, in order to move the ship uh, downtown to its current location. Uh, that was finally done in 2012. Uh, they were able to move the ship, it was about 105 tons. They moved it about three miles and put it inside the museum. Then they built up uh, the forward or the front facing wall on Queen Street. Uh, the museum now exists on the corner of Queen Street and Caswell Street in downtown Kinston, uh, roughly about 600 yards or so from where she was outfitted and equipped for war uh, between 1863 and 1864. That is the information for the museum. We are the CSS News Civil War Interpretive Center. We are 100 North Queen Street, and you can find us on facebook.com slash CSS News. And of course, you can always contact me if you would like some further information 
Uh, my information is matthew.young at ncdcr.gov. Thank you for joining me today for this program on the history of the CSS News.